Thank you. We turn to our next item of business today, which is topical questions. And we have question number one from Monica Lennon. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what plans it has to address the financial deficit that is reported to be facing 16 out of 20 colleges in the current financial year. Minister Shirley Ann Somerville. The recent Audit Scotland report Scotland's Colleges 2016 highlighted the financial health of the sector remains relatively stable. The Scottish Funding Council works closely with colleges to ensure that deficits are deficits are kept to a minimum and operational activity is not adversely affected and where required special measures are being put into place. Monica Lennon. Thank you. The Minister attempted to give a reassuring answer but there is no escaping that this is a worrying financial picture which comes at a time when the Scottish Government has cut funding to colleges in real terms year on year since 2010. Budgets have been pushed to breaking point. Now we know from the latest returns reported to the Scottish Funding Council that over three quarters of Scotland's colleges are expected to be in the red by the end of the year. Will the Minister take responsibility for the situation the college sector now finds itself in, which her government has created, and rule out any further cuts to this year's college budgets? Minister. Well, Scottish Government funding levels for 2015-16 remained steady at 2014-15 levels and in the hugely tight financial times that we are in, our 2016-17 budget protected college resource funding at £530 million, and that is despite a cut to the Scottish Government's overall budget due to the Westminster austerity agenda. Now, as I said, the recent Audit Scotland report concluded that the college sector is financially stable overall. Funding councils are working closely with the colleges to analyse these latest returns, for example, to determine how these figures relate to technical accounting adjustments such as property asset valuation reductions or net depreciation charges. But the member can be reassured that the Funding Council is and will continue to work with colleges through a range of specific measures where they are needed. Monica Lennon. The Minister is correct that funding for the sector remains broadly static for 15-16, but that's a real-term cut since 2010-11 of 18%. So I'm disappointed by the lack of assurances regarding funding for colleges in the next year, which I'm sure will be shared by those in the sector who are facing the uncertainty over further cuts. The Scottish Government have failed to deliver on the promises made to the further education sector from promising national pay scales without delivering the resources to deliver it, to bringing colleges into the public sector balance sheet and failing to deliver an adequate solution. Just last month, the Auditor General told the Public Audit Committee that it's difficult to assess whether the college merger programme has saved the sector money. As a result of these factors, colleges have lost staff and the number of part-time courses and students has reduced. Does the Minister accept the recommendations in the Audit Scotland report on colleges and what steps will the Minister be taking to ensure the long-term financial stability of the sector? Minister. Well, I hope Monica Lennon will appreciate that I'm not going to write Derek Mackay's budget for next year for colleges or any other part of my remit um, from... Well, I, well you, you, can, you, can indeed, you can indeed have a go, but I'm, I'm not going to go down that path today. Um, but we will be looking at the... the the funding for colleges and for universities um, and the rest of the education um, system through the budget process. And I hear her demands for calls for colleges. I hear her demands from the Labour Party for calls on many other aspects. And I think as we go through this budget process, it will be for the opposition parties uh, to, to come together and to, to deal with the budget um, in a realistic manner to work out where their priorities are, just as we do as a government. Um, financial situation that we are working in is tight, and I'm sorry, but it's, it's simply not acceptable to continue to demand money for education, for the NHS, for transport and every other section of the Scottish Government budget without a dose of realism about where that money is going to come from and the difficult decisions that you have to make in government about balancing the books. Colin Beattie. As a member of the Public Audit and Post-Legislative Scrutiny Committee, I have heard a great deal about arm's length foundations. Is it not the case that ALFs allow colleges to protect revenue that would otherwise have been lost following ONS reclassification? And could the Minister outline how much of the funds transferred into ALFs has been returned to the colleges? Minister. Well, the member makes a very important point, and Monica Lennon did um, also uh, 
um, discuss um, ONF declassification classification during her answer. Um, she seemed to assume that this was something that the Scottish Government had wanted or brought upon itself, and of course it was not. Uh, arms round foundations were a way of allowing colleges to, to keep uh, the reserves that they had before that reclassification, reclassification continued. Now, arms are, else are uh, separate to the, the, the Scottish Government and they are independent of the Scottish Government. They've been set up with a chari charitable purpose with the colleges, and it's for the colleges to have uh, determined during those articles of association how the money will be spent um, from ALVES. It's for colleges themselves to look at the money that's within the ALVES um, and make sure that they are spending that in the correct manner. Liz Smith. Thank you. Could I ask the Minister uh, about the Scottish Funding Council's response when it said uh, in its recent uh, estimate of the value of the murders, sorry, the total cost of the murders in 2016, that it did not include the cost of harmonising staff terms and conditions, which could obviously be significant. Could I ask the Minister whether the Scottish Government is carrying out uh, a very urgent and very thorough estimate of what that will involve? Minister. Well, the Funding Council has looked at uh, both the, the costs um, and the, the benefits which have accrued from the regionalisation process within college, and Liz Smith mentions um, one aspect of, of those. Uh, the government has, of course, also set up um, national bargaining for colleges, and many of the aspects which uh, she refers to will be dealt with through national bargaining, and the, the conclusions from that will be dealt with through the spending review process. Question number two, Adam Tompkins. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what its position is on the introduction of an injecting facility for drug users in Glasgow. Minister Aileen Campbell. Thank you. Uh, Glasgow City Joint Integration Board agreed yesterday for a business case to be developed to pilot safer drug consumption facility and heroin assisted treatment in Glasgow. The Scottish Government sees value in this proposal and are supportive of it, of it subject to the business case, which is to be presented to the Glasgow City Joint Integration Board in February 2017, being acceptable. Adam Duncans. I thank the Minister for that answer. There's no question that something must be done to tackle drug, ad drug addiction, not only in Glasgow, but right across Scotland. There has been a significant increase in the number of drug-related deaths in Scotland, which is why the SNP's decision to cut drug and alcohol funding in last year's budget is so yeah. baffling yeah. and so misguided. One specific question for the Minister today. Professor Neil McKegney of the Centre for Substance Use Research has cautioned that there is a real danger that we're moving away from a commitment to get addicts off drugs, unquote. What can the Minister say to reassure the Chamber today that getting people off illegal drugs and preventing drug use remain key priorities of the government's drugs policy? Minister. Uh, I thank the, the member for the supplementary. We, as a government, have invested heavily and significantly in uh, treating uh, drug and alcohol dependency issues since 2008 and continue to do so and continue to work with alcohol drug partnerships, continue to work with uh, stakeholders across uh, the country who have an interest in making sure that people can get the support they need and when they require it. Of course, there will be a mixture of solutions to people's uh, dependency issues, uh, the trauma that people have gone through their lives, the, the homelessness, the, the poverty issues, uh, and the uh, isolation that they may face. So there needs to be a holistic approach uh, to taken to ensure that we can help people when they need it, and that that help has to be timely as well. I think there's also a job for us to do in terms of tackling the stigma that's associated with drug dependency uh, as uh, well. So certainly from my point of view as the Minister for Public Health, certainly from this government's point of view in terms of the evidence by the significant uh, funding that we've put into this area, by our commitment to help people uh, help themselves and help people uh, become uh, more stable in life and tackling associated uh, risk, uh, risky behaviours, that we have a, sh a clear commitment to tackling and doing all we can to help Scotland uh, become much more uh, healthy as a nation and help sure that people can live their lives without being uh, unnecessarily dependent upon uh, illegal drugs. Adam Tompkins. The, the Minister talks about um, significant and sustained funding, but the fact is that this government cut drug and alcohol yeah, funding yeah. in its budget yeah, by 20% yeah. in last year's yeah. budget. Now, possession of heroin is, of course, an offence, but it is also an offence to permit premises to be used for the supply of heroin. What is the Scottish Government's position on whether the criminal law should be enforced in the circumstances uh, uh, that we're talking about. And what does the minister make of the suggestion by the UN's International Narcotics Control Board that fix rooms could breach international drug control treaties? 
Well, as I say, yesterday they had the agreement to look at the business case, make the business case, develop that business case, and we will look at those proposals and subject to them being acceptable, the Glasgow situation will, will, will move forward. In terms of the issues that the member raises around drugs legislation, the Lord Advocate would have to authorise any proposal uh, to establish a supervised injecting facility, and presumably somebody with his constitutional knowledge would have realised and understood that uh, as well. So I don't necessarily think we want to get into this debate around um, looking at this from a point of view that something is right or wrong or black or white. We need to be able to look at the, the issues that people face who have drug dependency issues in a much more holistic sense. There are issues around poverty, there are issues around homelessness, there are issues around um, the trauma that people have gone on in their lives that have led them down this uh, path. We need to tackle the stigma, we need to be able to deal holistically, as I said, with people's um, uh, these behaviours. And we need to, I think, work across the Parliament to ensure that we can, as a country, respond appropriately to help people when they need it. Clear hockey. To ask the Scottish Government what lessons might be drawn from the medically uh, supervised safe injecting rooms in Sydney, Australia and other centres across the world that may add to the potential benefits of such a facility in Glasgow. Minister. Um, I think the member raises a, an interesting point and we should look to all the evidence uh, from around the world to inform how we move forward as a country. Evidence from around the world indicates that drug consumption facilities are associated with a decrease in public agenda, uh, injecting their effectiveness at reaching and maintaining contact with highly vulnerable man, marginalised target populations has also been widely documented. However, we need to be mindful that we need to have a Scottish context, which is again why uh, the Glasgow pilot will be uh, important and important in terms of our knowledge and approaches going forward. Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The 20% cut to alcohol and drug partnership funding, which Adam Tompkins discussed, uh, is one of the most retrograde steps in tackling substance use in this country. It has led to a measurable outbreak of HIV in Glasgow, and all told, according to Rob McCulloch Graham, who is the chair of Edinburgh's joint Integrated Joint Board, that will lead to a total 1.3 million year-on-year -year cut to services in our nation's capital. That is a fire sale. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that given the weight of international evidence supporting initiatives like the injecting facility proposed for Glasgow, we should embrace it for Scotland? And will she now commit to reversing the cut to ADPs, which the cost of which is already measured out in human lives? We have invested significantly since we came to uh, uh, power in 2008 in terms of tackling and trying to help people cope with alcohol and drug dependency issues. Um, the letter from the Cabinet Secretary to the NHS boards uh, earlier on this year uh, asked them and sought that they um, used their resources to match the outcomes of previous years and to look at the fact that they've had an uplift to their budget. This is an NHS who have had uh, record uh, investment and have uh, support from this government. So we need to look at that wider context. We also need to look at what works and I accept the point, you know, we need to be mindful and open to um, other approaches, provided the evidence is robust and the evidence is there. And that's again why you know, we'll be looking at what's proposed in Glasgow with, with keen eyes to, to see what that case is, to see what, what evidence comes forward. That will also be what uh, informs the Lord Advocate if he needs to take a, a decision. So certainly from my perspective and from this government's perspective, the fact that we have some encouraging signs of drug taking amongst our younger population being uh, lower than they have been for some considerable time, I think many of our approaches are working. Uh, but again, I think we need to work across the Parliament because this is a Scotland-wide issue that requires not just me and my portfolio, but across all portfolios around housing, around social security, around a whole host of other areas to make sure that we can give people uh, back the, the opportunity to move forward with their lives with dignity and respect. John Finney. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, Minister, the Scottish Green Party support community-based uh, supervised medical interventions such as this. And David Little of the Scottish Drugs Forum talked about this as being an additional provision to deal with long-term users, some of for whom, and, and I quote, abstinence recovery is not on the immediate horizon. Would you join me in applauding the aim, as outlined by uh, Mr Liddell, of uh, saving lives? And would you acknowledge that if this were rolled out across Scotland, there's an opportunity to save even more lives? Yes. Again, I, you know, I 
I think certainly we need to make sure that the evidence is robust and that's what the IJB yesterday agreed to for that case to be made. We need to look at that evidence. We need to then, if that is uh, given uh, the go-ahead, need to look at that pilot and, the, and look at the evidence that that produces and certainly learn from the evidence within our own country and across uh, the, the world uh, as well. And certainly I met David Liddell uh, today from the Scottish Drugs Forum. I was hugely impressed by the level of commitment that they have and they show uh, the the diligence that they've put into this issue for uh, decades now and we want to work collaboratively indeed we do work collaboratively in the funding that we give to the Scottish Drugs Forum because we don't want to see the uh, statistics that we saw there's going around uh, drug uh, deaths that what, what was what I was presented with when I was not long in post that 700 or so figure represents 700 lives and families uh, affected and we certainly want to see that turned uh, around and that will require us to work uh, harder and understand that situation much more readily. So in, in many of the, the, the elements that John Finney spoke about there, I do agree with him that we want to save lives and we want to work on community-based solutions for that. Question number three, Christine Graham. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what measures it will take following the recent report on the performance of the Borders Railway. Minister Hamza uh, Thank you, Presiding Officer. I recently made this Parliament aware that my view, ScotRail's performance levels have not been to the acceptable standard that uh, is requested. Uh, that is why I requested an improvement plan uh, from ScotRail within that plan and the actions around it. There is a focus on the Borders route performance. I'm closely monitoring and reviewing progress uh, to ensure that better performance is delivered. Christine Graham. I thank the Minister for his answer. In the year from October 2015 to 2016, trains were cancelled on 47 weeks out of 52. In September, the government put in place the recovery plan for Borders Railway, yet on October the 20th, three trains were cancelled. One from Tweed Bank had to terminate at Newton Grange due to door problems, and even the next day there were two cancellations. Does the Minister consider the recovery plan is having any effect? Yes, sir. Uh, well, I would say to the member, of course, when an improvement plan is put in place, we have to give ScotRail the time to be able to enforce that and enact that. What I would say uh, is that there's a serious amount of work going into that. For example, £14 million pounds into the refurbishment and the improvement of the Class 158s. So I would also say to the member, uh, if, uh, unless I'm misquoting, of course, you can come back uh, at her members' debate, Last week, she did say, to judge by my experience in my inbox, there has been improvement in the services reliability in recent months. It was a bit bumpy at the beginning, but it's not now. So I'm sure the member also, from what she's just said last week, also recognises that there is an improvement. But I'm not going to be satisfied uh, until the Borders Railway reaches the PPM target and indeed some of those uh, problems uh, are resolved. So yes, there's an improvement plan in place, significant funding going into that. Uh, and now we're going to give ScotRail the time uh, to ensure that performance uh, uh, improves. If it doesn't, uh, I'll certainly be monitoring that very, very closely, and there will be some consequences to that. Christine Graham. Uh, I thank the Minister. Of course, my comments were anecdotal, but this report from two long-time supporters of the line, Bill Jameson and David Spaven, calls for an official Borders Railway specific survey to include the impact on repeat journeys, especially on commuters. Will the Minister commission one? Yes. I've met on a regular occasion with David Spaven and had the conversations uh, about the Borders Railway. Uh, their criticisms about forecast methodology, about rolling stock uh, and about, train infra uh, about track infrastructure are ones uh, that I'm very well aware of. I'm happy to continue discussing with them, with the campaign for Borders Rail, uh, with elected uh, members as well. As I said, there is, a, uh, there is uh, of course, PPM figures for the Borders Railway which must uh, be met. I'll be working to ensure that ScotRail meet those, I should say, the last three days, uh, figures have improved. And that's only the last three days. You can take a snapshot from three days, from a week, uh, from a month. But until there is consistent improvement, uh, I certainly won't uh, be happy. So there is an improvement plan in place, uh, some serious investment going into ensuring that borders improvement uh, it takes place in terms of its PPM. Uh, I'll be closely monitoring that. And of course, I'll keep the member, but others like David Spaven uh, and indeed the campaign for borders railway uh, up to date. Rachel Hamilton. Presiding officer, campaigners have called for six asks to provide a better service for Borders Rail service. And notwithstanding the improvement plan that Scott Rail have in place, um, they include improving the efficiency of door opening and closing, increasing the number of coaches on busier services, replacing defective radiators on class 158s, improving the maintenance regime for the coaches, redeploying more reliable class 170 units, and replacing faulty signalling equipment on the route. 
How many of these asks will the Scottish Government help to see implemented? And when can we expect to see these vital changes made to improve the performance of the Borders Railway? Minister. I thank the member for the question. I think those asks are very reasonable asks indeed, and they're the ones that ScotRail are taking forward. To just give some examples of some of those asks, uh, for talking sake, the radiators and the 158 uh, are going through an engineering check. Some of them have been replaced, some of them have been uh, refurbished. Uh, in terms of the 158s, an engineer will also meet the 158s on its departure and on its arrival uh, at stations uh, as well. Uh, uh, in terms of rolling stock being upgraded, uh, when it comes to peak times in 2017, due to cascading of rolling stock around the network, there will be more capacity uh, on the network uh, at peak times uh, in 2017. So some of what she's already asking, or the campaigners are asking for, uh, is being done. I think all those asks are very reasonable asks. Their asks that ScotRail are taking forward, each of the ones uh, that she mentioned I took a note of, uh, are being uh, taken forward. So I think the reasonable asks, uh, I think ScotRail's improvement uh, must, perform, must uh, improve their performance across the network, but there must be a particular focus on borders. Uh, and let's not take away, and I'd just like to end on this point, that the Borders Railway has been a great success for that uh, region. Uh, over a million uh, passengers, of course, at the longest rail, uh, new rail line uh, in a century. So there's great success, and all that success is celebrated. But notwithstanding that, there are some issues uh, and ones that ScotRail and, uh, are determined to get to the bottom of, and I will be keeping a personal eye on that. Neil Bibby. Um, the Borders Rail uh, Monitor report makes clear that Transport Scotland is directly responsible for many of the problems on the Borders Railway, including the deployment of Class 158 units and the cutting back of sections of double track. In addition, Transport Scotland massively underestimated passenger numbers on the line. Astonishingly, patronage at Tweed Bank in the first six months was 869 per cent above forecast. Clearly, the Minister agrees that there are serious questions about Transport Scotland's forecasting abilities, and I welcome the much-needed review of their methodology. Therefore, once uh, this review is completed, will the Minister commit to new appraisals of rail infrastructure projects, and specifically the Glasgow Crossrail scheme, given that this important project was rejected using a methodology he has now accepts to be flawed? Minister. What I would say in the spirit of trying to keep the consensus uh, around the success of the Borders Railway, as I said at committee uh, last week, there certainly uh, some of those forecasts were way off in some of the stations. So I instructed a review of forecast methodology. I will more than happily report those findings. Some of those initial findings actually have come forward and I think are, are very, very helpful. Uh, and I, the reason why I, I asked and instructed that review of forecast methodology is I don't want other rail projects to come forward and then be rejected on the basis of flawed uh, forecast methodology. In terms of retrospectively reviewing, look, if people want to come forward with me, with campaigns, uh, and I meet with re regularly with rail campaigners uh, from, 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 from Leavenmouth uh, right the way through uh, to, to, to the borders uh, and the improvements to be made on the borders, I'm more than happy for people to come to me I'll be very open-minded in that discussion, bearing in mind we're going into new control discussions on new control periods uh, six uh, and seven. Uh, but what I will do is commit to share that. Uh, what I would also request the member to do, the balance of, uh, in fairness of balance uh, and context, is to acknowledge that the Borders Railway has, of course, been a great success to that region. It's brought some much needed, much needed tourism, regeneration, uh, and I think it's something we can all say uh, has been a great, great success. Notwithstanding that, uh, I will make sure that he gets a copy of any of the reviews and the findings of the review of the forecasting methodology. Thank you very much. That concludes topical questions.